Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Crosspoint Online. We're making some of our sermons available for anyone who missed out or people who would like to catch up. In recent weeks, we've been looking at some of the basics of Christianity, some of the core foundational truths and aspects of the faith. We've talked about the Bible, who is Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit. We talked about the purpose of church. Uh, we talked about guidance and baptism and even persecution. And today we're looking at another core element of the Christian faith, and that is prayer. So we'll start today with a word from the Lord, and Blake has got our Bible reading for today. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Blake. Great to have you involved. So today's message is entitled, Why Should We Pray? And the answers might seem obvious, uh, but as I've said in previous weeks, sometimes it doesn't hurt to go back to the basics, to go back to things that might seem obvious, just to remind ourselves if we don't have the foundation right, it's very difficult to build on top of that. So why should we pray? Well, first of all, because the Bible tells us to pray. That's a pretty good reason. Philippians 4 that Blake just read tells us to pray about everything. Colossians chapter 2 tells us um, to devote yourselves to prayer. Um, so prayer is something that we should be diligent about, that we should be committed to. 1 Thessalonians says we should never stop praying. So prayer is obviously something that we should be doing all the time. And prayer is something we can do in all different circumstances. James chapter 5 says if any of you are suffering hardships, you should pray. Or any of you happy, you should sing praises. So prayer is something that we can do in all circumstances, good, bad, or indifferent. And the Bible certainly does indicate that prayer is important. All four Gospels in the Bible record times when Jesus set aside time to specifically to pray. And if Jesus took prayer seriously, it's probably a good idea for us to do the same. In Matthew chapter 6 and also in, in John 14, Jesus teaching his disciples to pray and he says, when you pray. He never says, if you happen to be praying, he says, when you pray. So we get the distinct, distinct impression that prayer is expected from God's people in May of 1996, there was a, an aircraft crash in Florida in, in the USA. Uh, a jet airline crashed. 110 people were killed. Ev everyone on board uh, was killed uh, in this crash. And this, it, this crash happened in a, in a region known as the Everglades, which is about 1.5 million uh, square kilometres of uh, swamp and marshland and, um, you know, mangrove area. Um, not, not great land, but a lot of wildlife, including some endangered species. Now, because so many people died in the crash, there was a major investigation. Obviously, people needed to know the cause of the crash. And if you've ever watched an episode of Air Crash Investigation, you'll know that uh, one of the first and most important tasks they have to do is to find the black boxes, to find the, the flight data recorder and also the voice box recorder. Now, the wreckage in this particular case was spread over quite a wide area and uh, the, the swampy you know, ground there was up, up to eight feet deep in water. So as you can imagine, it wasn't ideal circumstances for finding the black box. Dozens of researchers spent 14 days systematically combing up and down over every square inch um, of the area. They found uh, lots of pieces of wreckage, but they had not found the black box. Now, Florida, as you may know, has a fairly tropical climate and, and May is leading into their, you know, the northern summer. So the conditions were hot and humid. The searchers all had to wear heavy protective clothing to protect themselves from the germs in the swamp and also from the diesel fuel and the hydraulic, hydraulic liquid, everything that had spilled out from, from the jet, you know, from the aircraft crash. So after 14 days of wearing heavy equipment and searching in hot and humid conditions, it's fair to say the searchers were not only discouraged, they were fairly dehydrated as well and they still had not found the black box. 
Now, one of the searchers was a man called Felix Jimenez. Uh, he was a Christian man, and for 14 days, as he searched, he had been praying. He prayed for the families of the victims in the crash, the families of all of the deceased people, and he'd also been praying for his fellow searchers. But on the 15th day, as Felix took a break, it suddenly occurred to him that he had not once asked God to help them to find the black box. And so right there, as he sat there on his break, he prayed and asked God for direction and help in finding the black box. And then he stood up to resume his search and he got his pole and he stuck it down into the water and hit something metallic and it was the black box. Maybe he should have prayed earlier, but Felix himself wrote about his experience. He said, I thought of the many days we spent searching for the recorder, how we must have tramped over that very spot so many times, and I wondered why its retrieval had taken so long. And then I seemed to hear the response, why did it take you so long to ask? You see, God likes it when we ask. So the other reason why we should pray, not only because the Bible tells us to, we should also pray because God hears our prayers, because God answers our prayers. Prayer works. Our prayers can make a difference. Psalm 34 verse 4 tells us very simply, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. What a great reminder, what a great promise, what a great fact that God hears and answers our prayers. Eleven years ago this month, almost, almost exactly eleven years ago today, God answered one of my prayers in an unusual and unexpected way. To give you the context, um, I was at Bible College at the time in the year 2010. Uh, Tracy and I, middle of 2010, Tracy and I had known that it was time for me to, to start preparing for ministry. So I left work and enrolled at Bible College. And the one question we probably had was, how are we going to afford this? But we knew this is what God wanted and, and God assured us that he would provide, and he did uh, in a number of ways. And so, you know, we knew we were where God wanted us to be. But then fast forward, you know, about 18 months to November of 2011, and our money had run out, and uh, we had $8 in the bank. And one Sunday night, uh, I was quite stressed. I could not sleep. The Centrelink money wasn't due until Thursday, and we have three, you know, children, and the children like to be fed sometimes. And um, I was, yeah, I was quite anxious. I was, I was worried what were we going to do? And I was lying there. My mind was going around and around and around trying to think, come up with solutions uh, that would work, but, but nothing uh, seemed to work. And so finally, it was about two o'clock in the morning and I just poured out my heart to God in one of those prayers. I said, you, Lord, you called us here. You promised you would provide and so far you have, but now the money is gone and I don't know what to do and I just can't take this anymore. And I just said, Lord, you have to do something because I don't know what to do and I can't do any more. And then I finally got to sleep, and obviously in hindsight I should have prayed that prayer, you know, three hours earlier, but, you know, maybe I'm not that smart. But anyway, I finally got to sleep, and we woke up in the morning, and the kids were getting ready for school, and I was making their lunches, and Tracy uh, went online to check the bank balance. Now, I could have told her, you know, there's $8.49 in the bank, Trace, but um, she wanted to know, I guess, exactly before she went shopping to buy what she could. And then Tracy came out to me with a very uh, unusual, surprised look on her face, because there was more than $3,000 in our bank account. Now, that may not be a lot of money for some people, but it's a lot of money by our standards. And it turns out that money was from Centrelink. Centrelink had decided that Tracy should be getting more family allowance, and so they had back paid her for, for quite some time. And, you know, I don't know, about you, don't know about you, but I think when Centrelink is the answer to your prayer at exactly the right moment, you know, that has to be the hand of God. So... There you go, all that time that I was lying there in bed and stressed and anxious and worried and wondering what to do, the money was already on the way. God knew our need. God had already provided. The money was already on the way. And, you know, God had it under control. I couldn't see the answer, but the answer was on the way. It was all sorted. It was all controlled. There was no need for me to be so stressed and anxious and worried because God had answered my prayer. You know, in the book of Isaiah, in the Bible, God says, I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. See, this is what God can do. He sees the situation. He organises the solution even before we ask. He likes to be asked, but he can go ahead and answer before we ask. So God 
has the power to answer our prayer even before we ask. And God decides how and when to answer our prayers. Romans chapter 8 tells us that God uh, works everything out for good. Romans 8, 28, you know, according to his plans, not always our plans, but according to his plans, God is always working circumstances out for good. And Jeremiah 29, 11 assures us that God has good plans for us, plans for a future and a hope. And we need to hold on to these promises because sometimes, you know, God waits to be asked. Sometimes he goes ahead and answers, but we don't always understand God's answers to our prayer. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God gives us exactly what we ask for when we ask for it. And, and let's be honest, we like those stories. But sometimes God says, wait. You know, sometimes the timing is not right. And God just says, wait a while. And then he answers our prayer. Sometimes God knows our prayers are short-sighted, you know, and God can see the big picture and God knows the timing is not right. So he just tells us to wait for a while. And sometimes God says no. Sometimes God hears our prayer, but he just says no. You know, James chapter 4 verse 3 says, Even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You see, God's not some imaginary genie that just gives you whatever you want. You know, you just snap your fingers and ask for and it doesn't matter how it affects other people. It doesn't matter whether it's right or good or, or not. The genie just supposedly gives you your heart's desire. But see, God is actually a whole lot better than that because God actually cares about us. God cares about everyone. God knows what is best for us and for everyone. And so, for our own sake, sometimes God says... No. Sometimes our prayers are self-centred. Sometimes they're not helpful. And God says no, because he knows that what we think we want is not actually helpful, is not actually beneficial. So he says no. But sometimes when that happens, we might feel like God's not listening. Sometimes you feel like maybe I don't deserve, you know, to have God hear me. God doesn't listen to me because I've done something wrong. And the Bible has stories about people who did the wrong thing, people who disobeyed God, people who made a mess of their lives, but God still worked situations out for good in his time. One classic example is the story of Samson. You probably know the story. If you don't know the story of Samson, you can read it in the Bible in the book of Judges from chapter 13 through to chapter 16. Now, Samson had been blessed with an incredible gift. From birth, he was born, he had superhuman, extraordinary strength. But it came with a, with a secret, um, you know, and, a, and an instruction that Samson's hair was not to be cut. And uh, if he ever cut his hair, you know, shaved it off, then he would lose his strength. Now, Samson made some poor decisions along his life, uh, decisions that were certainly focused about his own pleasure and his own ambition and not necessarily what God wanted. And Samson eventually fell in love with a woman named Delilah. And she was a Philistine woman, you know, one of the, the enemies of God's people and uh, she eventually convinced Samson into revealing the secret of his extraordinary strength. And then she betrayed him. Once Samson was asleep, she shaved off his hair and called his enemies. Uh, and he was captured and Samson had his eyes poked out and was uh, forced into slavery. So talk about how to make a mess of your life. Hey, Samson had completely mucked things up. And then the Philistines decided to have a great big banquet to celebrate their victory. And they called Samson in dragged him in so that they could all laugh at him and, you know, you know, celebrate their victory and laugh at his weakness. And in Judges chapter 16, first of all, we read in chapter, in verse 28, it says, Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again. O God, please strengthen me again just one more time. Now, if there's ever a guy who doesn't deserve to have God listen to him because he's mucked up his life, it would be Samson. And yet God heard his prayer and and now Samson pushed, put his hands against the two pillars of this big great temple and he pushed. And verse 30 tells us that uh, Samson prayed again, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed and the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and all the people. So Samson killed more people when he died than he had during his entire lifetime. You see, God still listened to the prayer of Samson, even though Samson had made a complete mess of his life. Despite all the foolish decisions Samson had made, God still heard his prayer. 
So we might sometimes feel like we've messed up, we've made bad decisions, we've let God down, we've made decisions that did not work out well, but God can still hear our prayer and God can still work things out for his purposes in his time. Uh, 1 John chapter 5 tells us, We are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for something that pleases him. And since we know that he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. So God has the power to answer our prayers, even if our problems are self-inflicted. Now, sometimes there are people who might say, well, you know, God will give you whatever you want so long as you've got enough faith. Just have faith and God will give you whatever you ask for. And experience tells most of us that sometimes bad things do happen. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to God's people. Bad things happen to people with faith. Acts chapter 12 tells us that bad things happened to two of the apostles. Now, let's just start reading through from the start of the chapter of Acts chapter 12. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. So one apostle killed, one arrested. You know, this is not not great stuff. This is not an easy life for having faith, is it? Um, Peter's arrest took place during the Passover um, celebration and he was imprisoned, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. So that's worth noticing. The church was praying specifically for Peter. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep fastened with two chains between two soldiers and other soldiers stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, get up quick, and the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals, and he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realise it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city and this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street and then the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realised this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. So this is, remember the church who were praying for Peter and they've gathered at this one house specifically to have this big prayer meeting, which is really great. Then we read, Peter knocked at the door in the gate and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer it. When she recognised Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter's standing at the door. And of course they said, yes, God's answered our prayer, let him in. Oh, no, actually, they said, what? You're out of your mind. When she insisted, they decided, well, it's not really him. It must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking, and when they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. So they were all gathered together to pray for Peter, and God's answered their prayer, and they were actually quite shocked that God has answered their prayer. See, God has the power to answer our prayer even when we don't really expect it. There was another story I heard once about a a drought in a country town and the drought had gone on for quite some time and things were getting tough, you know, for the farms and the economy and getting pretty desperate. So two of the local churches decided to have a combined prayer meeting to pray for rain. And 50 people gathered together in one of the outdoor parks, you know, to all pray together for rain, which is really great. Only one person out of those 50, only one person bought an umbrella which is kind of, kind of strange. But anyway, sometimes God answers even if we don't have enough faith. So God can do more than we ask or expect. And God answers his prayer in his own way. Some of you know this story already. I probably shared it with some of you that when I was six years old, my father was diagnosed with cancer, multiple malignant melanomas. And they did surgery, um, you know, but the doctors were not, not hopeful. Um, they only gave him about a 5% chance of survival. In fact, the surgeon thought Dad had about two weeks left to live. 
Now, lots of people prayed for my dad. He worked with a mission organisation. Um, Mum and dad had both grown up in the church, extended family, lots of Christian supporters, and lots of people prayed for my dad. And dad went back for a checkup, and the cancer was completely gone, totally gone, um, and it's never come back, and my dad is still alive today in his 80s. So I know for certain that God can do miracles, but I also know that it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, Trace and I have three children and our youngest son, uh, James, when he was three or four, he started having, having epileptic seizures. And we took him to the doctor and you know, they did scans and they found a, a cyst about the size of a golf ball um, you know, in his head pressing against his brain. Now, Trace and I prayed, our parents prayed, our friends prayed, and Trace and I, we were absolutely convinced that God would heal James. And I told Tracy, keep a, keep a copy of that scan because one day we'll stand up in church and we'll say, here's the before and here's the after and look what God did, praise God, isn't it? What a great answer to prayer. But James continued to have epileptic seizures and the cyst got bigger. When James was eight years old, he had brain surgery, like major eight-hour brain surgery, which um, improved his situation but didn't completely cure him. And when James was 12 years old, he had more brain surgery, 13 hours this time, a massive operation, which again, same result, improved but not healed. And now James is 22 and he still takes anti-seizure medication and he can't drive and he can't hold down a job and I don't know why. And sometimes I ask, why? We don't always understand why God does things. Sometimes it's a perfect ending and sometimes it's not. And I know there are people at Crosspoint and maybe other people who are watching who have prayed fervently for something and it hasn't happened. And I know people at Crosspoint have lost loved ones, even children that they, they earnestly prayed for. And we all know sometimes in this life we need to live with pain. But I, as I prepared this sermon, I asked myself again, why? Why do some prayers get answered the way we want and some don't? You know, there's lots of great Bible verses about prayer. There's lots of stories in the Bible about answered prayer. We've all heard other people's testimonies about answered prayer. But there's also stories of pain and suffering and hardship and disappointment. So I looked up a lot of verses as I was preparing this message because I want my sermons to be biblical. I want them to be balanced. I want them to be to be real. You know, I don't like it when pastors and churches make promises that they, they can't keep. And I don't want to give anyone the impression that if you just pray in faith that life will be perfect and everything will work out. Life will be wonderful. Because God doesn't promise us an easy life. God doesn't say that we will never face hardship. But he does promise to be with us through all circumstances. And as we heard from Philippians, he promises peace of mind, peace of mind that can only come through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So Jesus himself suffered. Jesus suffered physical hardship, you know, hunger and thirst and tiredness and obviously the, the crucifixion was, um, was not good. And Jesus also suffered emotional hardship. He had friends who died. He had he had friends who, who betrayed him, friends who abandoned him, people rejected him. He had friends who denied even knowing him. You know, all of those things cause us pain and Jesus experienced that as well. He suffered mockery and abuse and rejection and abandonment, separation. In Luke chapter 22, just before Jesus was arrested, he prayed and he prayed a profound prayer. He said, Father... If you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And that, I think, is the key. It is perfectly okay to ask God to take away the pain and the hardship. But we need to understand and accept that God has plans that we cannot always see. Sometimes God might have a purpose. The purpose might be he wants us to learn a lesson but other times, the purpose might be that he wants other people to see our faith in action. See, when we pray, we can certainly ask God for good things, but we need to accept his will. We have to trust him that he knows best. And God might say yes, 
And that's great, and that's what we hope for. And God might say, wait. Or he might say, no. And sometimes he just takes the burden away. Sometimes he provides help, medical solutions or friends to help you carry the burden. And sometimes people just live with hardship for a long, long time. But the important lesson I think we need to learn from the Bible is not to stop praying. God may not answer the prayer we want or even when we want, but he you know, doesn't answer the way we want or when we want, but he, he, he does work. God does work all things out for good according to his purposes and in his time. Prayer works. Prayer is powerful. Prayer makes a difference. You know, some people, some people think that the Victorian state government under Daniel Andrews um, is not very supportive of Christian people and Christian beliefs. A lot of people feel that way. But, you know, even, even the Victorian parliament under Daniel Andrews' government, even they know that prayer works. They know prayer is powerful and influential. Why do I say that? Because there are laws now in Victoria that say it is, you are not allowed to pray for people in certain circumstances. Now, if God was not real and if prayer was just words bouncing off the ceiling and meaningless, why would they bother to ban prayer? Why would they make it illegal? Because even they know prayer works. Prayer is powerful. God hears our prayers and God answers our prayers. Because why else would they bother to ban it? James chapter 5, verse 16 says, The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So keep on praying and specifically pray for our governments because, you know, let's face it, they all need it. So why should we pray is the question for today. Why should we pray? Well, we pray to honour God. We pray to thank God. We pray to give our burdens to God, to hand them over to him. And as we heard from Blake this morning from Philippians 4, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank him for all he has done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. It's a great verse, isn't it? So my encouragement to us all is pray regularly, pray diligently, pray humbly, pray sincerely. Let's encourage each other to pray. Let's enjoy the gift of prayer and let's celebrate answered prayer. And speaking of that, since I prepared this sermon and preached it, which was a week and a half ago now, since then I've had another answered prayer in my own life, which I can share with you. A couple of months ago I went to the doctor um, who gave me just a health, health checkup, um, you know, just making sure I was all right. He sent me off to do some tests and everything, and most things were pretty good except for one. There was one, one result that the doctor was concerned about. He said it wasn't good. And so we had a follow-up test, which was uh, worse, and um, the doctor, he thought it might be cancer. In fact, and he thought it might be an aggressive cancer because, you know, the results were heading in the wrong direction. Now, I'll be honest, at the time, I, I hardly told anyone, only, only a couple of people. I, I figured it might still be nothing. I didn't want to, you know, cause, you know, make a fuss if it turned out to be nothing. Um, but Tracy, my wife, she was certainly praying on my behalf. Well, last week I had another test and this time the result was not only uh, normal, it was the healthy normal. It was an excellent, it was an outstanding result. In the words of the doctor who um, is not a Christian, the doctor said, your God has intervened. So praise God for that. See, God has the power to answer prayer even when someone else has to pray for it on our behalf. So why should we pray? Because the Bible tells us to pray and because it works. There's plenty of things that we can worry about in this world, but the Bible says not to worry about them, but instead pray about everything. And there's some words to a, a famous old hymn that I just am reminded of as I, uh, whenever I think about prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. 
all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I hope you're encouraged today to, to spend time in prayer and to give, give your burdens to the Lord and to pray, yeah, pray constantly. Let's pray right now. Father God, we just want to say thank you for the gift of prayer. It's such a great thing. Thank you for the peace that you can give us through prayer. And sometimes we know you answer our prayers and um, just the way we ask and, and we're always grateful and we, we thank you for that. Sometimes we have to wait and sometimes we have to endure hardship because you have purposes that we cannot see. Whatever the results are, Lord, I just pray that all of us will be diligent in our prayer life. Acknowledge the answered prayer and praise you for that and I praise you for answered prayer in my own life. And Lord, I just ask your blessing upon all the faithful prayers all over the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We also have some more sermons coming up. The one that Glenn recorded on about guidance will be available very soon. And uh, I hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.